technically I didn't forget the microphone this time. I, I I activated it before I started talking. Hello everybody, welcome to Cubone. My name is Quentin, and welcome back to another Helldivers Tuesday. Your weekly recap of everything that has happened in the last week in Helldivers 2. This week, a lot of important things happen, starting with, of course, the 10 Planet Defense Major Order being completed on time successfully, followed by a little bit less of a successful major order. But that's okay, because we have a new weapon to talk about. We have new patch notes to talk about. We have a lot to talk about. And without any further ado, of course, starting as always with last Tuesday, things were looking grim as we were closed in on from both sides. Helldivers spread thin between too many planets. It looked like we were going to fail the major order to defend 10 planets, but it looks as though I wasn't the only one to notice this as divers rallied together and by the end of the night had taken Oshune. By the early hours of Wednesday, the defense campaigns of both Astanu and Mort had been completed as well thanks to the efforts of the Midnight Divers, those who fight for liberty while the rest of us rest for the next fight. As of Wednesday morning, we had two more defenses with Oshune back under attack alongside Virilia 5. We had held the bots out of the Tsar sector, so it seemed they were changing approach to take more of the Trigon Sector. As we neared completion of Oshune's defenses, the bugs tried to attack Fori Prime, a cowardly attempt to distract us, no doubt. However, upon liberating Oshune, the supply lines to Fori were cut, granting us an instant victory over it, as well as bringing us to eight out of 10 planets. A new defense campaign on Ostaru began, and people realized that if we took Chopesa 4, we could repeat what happened on 4 8, this time for three planets at once. While the idea was interesting, the strategic play was to take the planets individually to keep bot forces spread thin. Over Wednesday night, this proved successful as we took Virilia 5 and by the early hours of Thursday morning, Estatu as well. Around this time, we also took back control of Vernon Wells and began work on re-establishing the Menkent line. Additionally, while progress was slow, we were gradually whittling down Hellmire, and if we could complete that, then we could keep the bugs off of Astanu. By the end of Thursday, we were awaiting a new major order, and despite a new defense mission for Astanu, once again, divers were spread apart. A good 40% of players were working on Astanu, sure, but the other two largest forces, 14% on Omicron and 10% on Menkent, were barely enough to hold their planets on a stalemate. The downtime was a nice reprieve after fighting for the major order so hard. On Friday morning though, it was back to business with a new major order. The interesting thing this time around is that for the first time, we had a true choice to make. We were told we could only save either Chu or Penta in the Lakyle sector. Chu would give us access to the new MD-17 anti-tank mines, while Penta would give us the R-177 uh, airburst rocket launcher. That might be RL, and I just misspelled it. RL-77 Airburst Rocket Launcher. Either way, though, first we had to break back through the Menkent line. Given our track record, it felt obvious divers would go for the rocket launcher, but I was personally more worried what this would do to the community. We'd spent, so far, the whole war fighting bugs and bots, but for the first time, we were put into a situation where divers could spend hours on something they want, only to not get it because they were part of the minority. We saw what happened when divers refused to give up Malevolon Creek, and I worry that a subset could grow bitter, and perhaps even traitorous if they don't get their way. By the end of Friday, though, we had taken Lasoth from 19% to over 80%. Menkent was much slower from 38% to 45%. The bug front was much worse, though, with Hellmire dropping from 16% down to 10%, and Omicron, despite its high player count, only rising from 36% to 43%. The same rate as Menkent, despite nearly quadruple the player count. Saturday morning, divers broke through Lasoth, making headway into Penta. Just as predicted, from 2 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time to 2 p.m., we had already claimed 46%, making it clear which stratagem was going to be rescued. Meanwhile, yet another defense campaign on Oshune began as divers were preoccupied on Penta. 
Two hours in, the defense was failing, as divers were split between liberating Omicron to cut off supply lines or defending Oshune itself, causing us to begin losing both. By the end of the day, more than half of the nearly 100,000 divers on duty were on Penta, and had gotten it up to 70% before we'd even cleared Men Kent, much less Chu. Oshune's defenses were barely holding ground, though forces from Omicron did supplement it, even as overall player count dropped. On Sunday morning, there was a big shift as at 4 p uh, pardon me, 4 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time, we cleared Penta, unlocking the airburst rocket launcher, and then moved on to Oshune, clearing the defense around noon-ish. Once we'd cleared Oshune, the majority of players split between Omicron and Short Bay with about 45% of the player base each. Now, before I move on, I would like to discuss, pardon me, I would like to discuss the airburst rocket launcher in a bit more detail. With the airburst rocket launcher, the majority of posts, uh, both on the Reddit and on Twitter, are discussing how it's not entirely what we wanted, and I don't entirely understand that, if I'm being honest. So, the Airburst Rocket Launcher is a close range, er, pardon me, is not a close range weapon, it is not an anti-heavy weapon, it is not an anti-air weapon, and it is not good for detonating near your team. It is, however, a long-range anti-group weapon and a long-range fabricator and nest-destroying weapon. While I'm not the biggest fan of it in general, it is worth noting that people are using the weapon wrong. They are using it the same way they would use the Eats or the Recoilless Rifle, and that's simply not what it's made for. Now, that said, it's ex it's... Pardon me. <laughs> Its actual purpose might not be a needed one, as we have other things like the uh, airstrikes, uh, pardon me, the eagle airstrikes, as well as other things like grenade launchers and such to take care of fabricators and bug nests and even groups. And the it's just not really worth taking up both the weapon slot and the backpack slot when you could have something that could handle something, uh, any, any purpose that it could serve much better. That said, again, I don't understand why people are upset over it not taking care of armor, because the point of an airburst weapon is to explode the muni munition above a target, creating a wide dispersion of fragments. It's a hand grenade on steroids, as this diver put it. It, after using it, it's just frankly showing that people didn't know what they were getting in for. But I still don't think we ever would have gone to Chew as this post represents. Because as this diver, Big Wingus72, put it, we're not going for the airburst rocket launcher. We were going for Penta. Because getting to Chew meant having to go through Men Kent, a planet with fire tornadoes, something that, especially with the unmitigated fire damage as we'd seen it, nobody wanted to fight through. So instead of going to Chu, we went through the much easier Lasath, an ice planet that is actually built for us to be able to get through easily, and we made it to Penta. There just, there was no reason, reasonable way that we were going to go to Chu. So perhaps, it would have been more interesting to see these two switched. Put the weapon that people wouldn't have been as interested in, the anti-tank mines, on the path that would have been easier to get to through Lasath into Penta, and then put the weapon that people weirdly were interested in, the Airburst, despite that not being consistent with a lot of people's playstyle, people tend to go for weapons over armaments. So putting that on the harder path through Men Kent would have been an interesting experiment to see. However, of course, that is not how things played out. Back to the notes uh, on Sunday. Despite the forces massing on Omicron, uh, the planet was locked in a stalemate and we were missing essential forces on Short Bay, which we needed to clear to reach Chu to succeed the Major Order, which was still going on despite us clearing Penta. By Sunday night, Omicron had begun to trend upward to reach 60% by 9, 9 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. By Monday morning, things had remained the same though, meaning of course that we had failed our major order. No one wanted to fight through Men Kent and its fire tornadoes again, like I said. 
Uh, no one cared enough to get through Chort Bay, because what's 45 medals when we could break through Omicron? And so, Chu was left unliberated for the time being. Omicron, however, had gained another 20% by that morning, meaning we'd soon be pushing further into the bug's territory, or so we thought. Later on Monday morning, we were quickly met with a new major order. High priority broadcast. Op legitimate undertaking terminated. Emergency situation in Terminid Quarantine Zone. Several weeks ago, the Helldivers activated the Terminid Control System on the barrier planets Errata Prime, Fenrir 3, Meridia, and Touring. Since then, the termicide produced by the TCS has kept the Terminids at bay. However, the TCS is no longer functioning as intended. Terminid outbreaks have erupted on all barrier planets. The bugs are displaying resistance to termicide, something our top scientists previously believed impossible. The situation on Meridia is even worse. There, terminid reproduction rates have exploded overnight and continue to increase exponentially. The planet is already almost fully infested. While the exact mechanism for this hyper-reproductive adaptation is unknown, it appears to be linked to continued termicide exposure. So far, this effect is limited to Meridia. It cannot be allowed to spread. Operation Legitimate Undertaking has been placed on an indefinite hiatus. Meridia is unsalvageable. The Helldivers are ordered to deactivate the Terminid control system on the remaining barrier planets immediately. So our new major order, of course, as that said, is to deactivate the Terminid control system. While Meridia has already fallen, we are to liberate Errata Prime, or rather, we are to complete the order objective on Errata Prime, Fenrir 3, and Turing. Helldivers immediately got to the task, eager to make up for the previous loss. By 3.30 Mountain Daylight Time, Fenrir 3 had 63% of the nearly 165,000 Helldivers planet side. Turing had a good chunk behind this at 35%, and Errata Prime bringing up the rear with 11%. The planets were losing liberation fast, despite divers' best efforts to destroy the TCS as quickly as possible. At the same time, the bugs launched an assault on Crimsica, and with no additional divers to help save it, things looked dire for the little red planet. Most despairingly, however, was the retreat from Omicron. There weren't enough divers to hold the line, and by 3.30, the planet had already fallen to less than 70%, estimated to be at 0% in less than a day. Uh, despite that, actually, I believe, uh, yeah, Omicron is technically not at 0%. We are holding it steady at 3.8. That's not in my notes. That's currently, uh, as of the airing of this broadcast. The bot front saw the same fate as divers rushed to dismantle the TCS. Every planet facing the automaton threat began rapidly falling. By Tuesday morning, the progress on the dismantling of the TCS was going slow. Fenrir 3 was sitting at 56%, going up at over 1.5% per hour, with over half the player base working toward the goal. Turing and Arata Prime were stagnant as we pushed through Fenrir first, choosing to take them one at a time. As the day really got started, another defense campaign on Astanu. Astanu? I don't know why I always want to say Astantu. I think I've mentioned that every stream now. A, uh, yes, a new defense campaign on Astanu began, and just like with Crimsica, it's likely we will lose this one. With only 11,000 divers on the planet, the bugs had more than five times the progress we did as we chose to focus on the major order. We'll just have to pay those bugs back in double when we're done. And that should be made quite a bit easier, as we do have new patch notes to go over as well. While there were general updates to weapons, stratagems, armor, and enemies, and a change to the spread democracy mission, the primary one off the bat is that armors above 100 uh, resistance reduce headshot damage. This has been something that has been asked for a very long time, and it's good to see it finally implemented. Additionally, burning damage has been reduced by 15%, something that I mentioned before. It would have been nice to have this when we were trying to take Men Kent, but I digress. Uh, it's here now. Moving on to the weapon changes. Crossbow. A uh, the explosion size has been reduced. The stagger has been increased. The amount of mags have been decreased from 12 to 8. The amount of resupply mags have been increased from 6 to 8. The ergonomics have seen a slight improvement, and the muzzle velocity has seen an improvement. Or pardon me, the ergonomics have seen a slight reduction. 
and the muzzle velocity has seen an improvement. The mag size of most weapons was reduced, but the viability of this weapon has mildly increased, mostly due to its, its stagger being increased. Uh, I'm still personally not going to find myself using this, but I digress. The Quasar saw the uh, recharge time increase by five seconds. It's a pretty massive nerf for the Quasar Cannon, moving this even further below the Eats in terms of usefulness. The Adjudicator DMR, something I was very uh, critical of when it released, has had its default fire mode now moved to full auto, which is something anybody using it was already moving it to, so having it be the default is very nice. The recoil was reduced, a massive buff for that thing. The mag size has increased from 6 to 8. The resupply mag size has also increased from 6 to 8, and it has been moved to the assault rifle category. While I don't think this is going to take over as the new uh, meta by any means, it has decent power, but it was almost unusable because of its recoil and slow usage. These buffs mean that it might start to see some actual usage. A uh, pretty big one, the laser cannon has had an increase to its damage and a decrease to its damage versus large volume bodies, as it's stated. The laser cannon is still a great weapon, especially for low level divers, though this does seem to double down on it not being a tool for large quote unquote boss enemies, but more for lowering numbers while other weapons take out the big targets. Personally, I still think the thing's incredible, I'm just not going to take it over some of the other options. The Punisher Plasma, pretty big nerf, I would say. The mag size has decreased from 12 to 8. The resupply mags have increased from 6 to 8. The projectile speed uh, has been increased, though it does maintain its range. And the big one, the damage falloff, essentially has the damage falloff has decreased, meaning that it has an increased uh, area of effect. And it has been moved to the energy weapons category. The adjustments here, unfortunately, do not help it overtake its big brother, the Plas-1 Scorcher, but does make it slightly more viable for low-level players that haven't unlocked the Scorcher yet. Yeah, I'd, I'd say it is fairly viable now, especially for taking out things like the Scout Striders, but beyond that, especially at higher levels, it's just not one that's going to be useful, especially because it is a paid Battle Pass weapon. Uh, meanwhile, the Scorcher is not. It just takes longer to unlock. The Arc-12 Blitzer has had its shots per minute increased from 30 to 45, and it has been moved to the Energy Weapons category. However, as far as I can tell, this has solved none of the primary problems with the Blitzer, and in fact, it might be worse, as the gun tended to have a control problem over its shots, and increasing the shots per minute could just exacerbate the problem. So I personally will still, pretty much any of the weapons from Cutting Edge, I still don't use. The only one I want are the stun grenades, and I can wait on that. That said, the R36 Eruptor has had its mags decreased from 12 to 6, uh, but it has a faster, or pardon me, additionally, it has a faster explosion damage drop off. Its AOE has decreased. I'm pretty upset about this one because I finally started using the gun and it feels next to useless now. There's not enough ammo for it to be meaningful against groups of any kind and the explosion drop off mean it means that it fails to punch through light and medium armor the way it used to. Pretty big L. Uh, literally I used this thing for maybe the third time while recording b-roll for this and it's, it's, it's unusable now, it's actually terrible. The LAS-16 Sickle has had its mags decreased from 6 to 3. Uh, while it's not the best, uh, it is a nerf. The weapon's effectively infinite mag size means that this likely will not affect it all that much, uh, as long as it's used properly. However, one big change is the buff to the LAS-5 Scythe, which has had its damage increased from 300 per second to 350 per second, though its mags have been decreased from 6 to 4. Similar to the sickle, the mag decrease shouldn't really do much to this weapon, but the damage buff actually does a lot to make this weapon more viable. Though it is still arguably a weaker version of the sickle, given the shortcomings of the beams over bolts. That said, you can unlock the scythe for free, effectively, as long as you play. Meanwhile, the sickle does require the premium war bond, which means you can still get it for free, it just takes longer. So you're likely to have the scythe much earlier. I still don't have the sickle. That said, very, very big one, the RS-422 Railgun has had its armor penetration increased in both safe and unsafe mode. It has had a decrease to its stagger force. 
It's finally here, the railgun buff that we've all, except for Garrett, been waiting for. And after finally buying the damn thing, I can honestly say that I am still not impressed. It requires so much more precision and caution to take out even something like a Hulk, much less Chargers and Bile Titans who are much less willing to let you line up a shot. The Eats, Recoilless, Autocannon, and Quasar still feel infinitely more viable for me in that order. I d I don't know why I wrote it like that. The recoilless is not more viable than the autocannon or quasar. Ignore what I said. Moving to something that a lot less people care about, the MG-101 heavy machine gun has had its third person crosshair enabled. Wow, it's had a quality of life change rather than buffing its damage or more importantly its mag size or total mag capacity. The weapon is still one of the least useful stratagems and I'd much rather the MG or stalwart any day of the week and I don't even use those that often. That said, one that I have used in the past, both the R63 Diligence and the R63 CS Diligence Counter Sniper have both had their uh, damage increased. For the Diligence, it has increased from 112 to 125. For the Counter Sniper, it's had its damage increased from 128 to 140 and had its ergonomics improved. The Diligence Counter Sniper is basically just the same weapon, but you unlock it later and it has a bit better stats, though I think it has more recoil and a lower mag size. But the Counter Sniper still stands as the perfect weapon for divers who want to roleplay Metal Gear Solid, stealthing around the lower difficulties, and sniping anything that stands in the way of liberty. It still won't see much usage at high diff play, but hey. Yeah, do what you can. Moving on to the pistols. The P19 Redeemer has had its recoil increased, but let's be honest, this thing could flip your screen upside down and still be the best secondary in the game. The P2 Peacemaker has had its damage increased from 60 to 75. Pretty good buff, but I will still recommend the Redeemer. The only thing the Peacemaker really has going for it is that it is your starting pistol. You have it from the beginning. It's reliable, but as soon as you can get the Redeemer, I'd recommend it. The P8 Senator, which is the revolver that I forgot was in the game, has had its damage increased from 150 to 175 and has had a speed loader added when reloading from empty. Basically, once you empty out the entire chamber, you have a faster reload, which is very nice and this thing's great for roleplay. It is, it is admittedly really cool, and being able to reload quite quickly after emptying, emptying the chambers is a pretty good buff. Also, 175 damage, it's not gonna be anything too reasonable, but it, it's enough to make it usable. That said, the LAS-7 Dagger, I think, has had a pretty good buff, increasing its damage from 150 to 200. While the Redeemer's still obviously takes the cake for viability, I won't judge anybody for wanting to use a laser pistol, it's pretty fucking cool. The 200 damage per second, though I'm not sure how long it can fire for, is pretty good. The infinite ammo, just like the other laser weapons, does make it a decent consideration, now that the damage has been buffed considerably. For reference, like I said, the Diligence Counter Sniper does 140 after the buff. Meanwhile, this thing does 200 per second. I can only shoots for like two seconds, but Still, that, that's pretty that's pretty reasonable. That's 400 damage. Moving on to the assault rifles, the AR-19 Liberator and the AR-23C Liberator Concussive have both had their damage increase from 55. The Liberator is now at 60 and the Concussive is now at 65. Putting these two together, because there's not really much to say, while the default Liberator is still pretty great for destroying those smaller bugs and bots, the Concussive can now be considered for taking out weak points, mostly on the bot side. The buff damage doesn't make it a great contender for best primary, but it's far from useless. We didn't get a buff for the Penetrator, and I don't really get that. The medium armor penetration is not really great when you only do 45 damage per shot. The JAR5 Dominator, has had its damage decreased from 300 to 275. Despite this weapon's unique firing method, it was overshadowed, much like most other weapons, for dealing with medium armor by the Scorcher. So decreasing the damage just feels like we're gonna use this weapon even less than we already were. And speaking of weird nerfs, Oh, actually, I was corrected on this. The Steam patch notes list this as the ARAX-23 Guard Dog having a decrease in damage by 30%. That is inaccurate. That one was not debuffed because that is the bullet weapon one. The one that was debuffed was the LAS-AX-23 Guard Dog. The laser variant has had its damage decreased by 30%. Frankly, I have not noticed a difference. I've been playing for two days straight since this patch came out 
no fucking difference. It's still the only thing I will bring in unless I'm bringing in the auto cannon. It's just that good. That said, my, my notes on here are useless because I was confused why they nerfed something nobody was using. <laughs> Pretty funny that we got a patch for the RL-77 Airburst rocket launcher already, where it will no longer detonate when shot near stratagems or other helldivers, and it has, had, it has had its proximity radius decreased. Less than a week, it's already received its first buff, though as we've already discussed, it's not likely to be enough to make this weapon worth using. It's just not great. I really wish we had gotten those anti-tank mines. I recognize the downsides to them, but they would have been fun. I still like using mines. Moving on though to the AMG-43 Machine Gun Sentry, something I didn't really expect to see a buff. It has had its health raised to match the other sentries. It's a bit disappointing because this was due for a massive damage buff, so it just remains the poor man's Gatling Sentry. I, I just, I, I, it's nice to see it buffed, but I, it's not gonna see any usage to anybody over level, what, 10, 15? I think 10. I think 10 is when you unlock the Gatling Sentry. Pretty big one for Garrett though. The ARC-3 Tesla Tower has had its health increased by 33%. I'm, I'm mostly joking there. I don't think you've used the Tesla Tower for like months, but it is a, it's a fun stratagem. So I'm glad it got a little bit of a buff. I'm very confused by this next one as it is the FAF-14 Spear has, and I quote, added reload stage reload after the spent missile has been discarded. I have never used this stratagem and I have no idea what the hell that means. But that is it for the weapon patch notes. Moving on to the enemy patch notes. I'm going to quickly fire through these and then talk about them. The Bile Nursing Spears have had their move speed reduced. The Hulks have had their uh, required force to stagger reduced. The Hulk Scorcher Flame has been decreased by 20% on top of the Universal 15 uh, percent fire damage decrease. The standard devastator has had its fire rate increased. I had a bit of a double take there because it just says devastator and then it clarifies only for the standard devastator. I thought the heavy was going to be just the worst thing on the planet now. The gunships have had their sideways movement improved, which sucks. Scout Strider riders have had their vulnerability to explosions decreased. Some people on the subreddit were worried that the Scorcher was going to become less effective because of this, but after using it, it's, it's still just three shots and they're down. Um, fog generators, health and armor increased. I'm not the only one who put in their notes, what the fuck is a fog generator? <laughs> Cause I, I see even Stylosa was like, I have no idea what this thing is. <laughs> so this might be something new that could be coming. And I'm confused why it has had a, a, a buff in the patch notes. So I'm concerned what this is. That said, the gunship spawners have decreased the amount of active gunships that they can have at any one time. So this is a pretty massive gameplay nerf, I would say, for solo players. Enemy patrols for spawning less than four players. So if you're in a four player group, nothing will change. But for every player less than four you have, in, even down to solo, the, the number of patrols on the map will progressively increase. Meaning if you're playing on solo on those higher difficulties, it's going to be rough. This game is meant to be played with four people. Some people don't really like that. I understand. But the, this is the, the developers want it to be a four player game and they're pushing for it. And playing with ran randoms is my preferred way to play this game at this point. Uh, it's just you, you have something to fall back. You get so many reinforcements with four people that it like dying just becomes non-consequential for the most part. I, I just prefer playing that way. It's a lot more fun. Moving on to the gameplay changes. The objectives are less likely to spawn as far apart as they used to. This should make speed running uh, a little more easy, which is nice. Uh, that said, you know, you can't really speed run on solo anymore because of the patrol change. The option to disable auto climbing and vaulting while sprinting was added. Thank you, for the love of God, I'm tired of clambering up on top of supply boxes. The spread democracy mission to raise the Super Earth flag can now be enjoyed on every difficulty. That's actually, I really like that. It's a super easy mission and it's just, you, you feel so democratic while doing it. When readying up, Helldivers now salute to ensure maximum democratic readiness. I noticed this before I saw the patch notes and I, 
had this moment in my head where I was like, was this always there? So I'm glad I'm not crazy. Added ambiance to tr the Tremor planetary hazard to underline the severity so divers can react accordingly. I don't, I don't get that. What do you react? H how do you react to the Tremors? Like, you can't do anything. They're just there. They slow you down. They're incredibly frustrating. Shots that, this was a pretty big one. Shots that ricochet from heavy armored enemies will now properly hit the diver who fired them. Trigger discipline is highly recommended. So there have been a good handful of people on the subreddit and on Twitter complaining that anything that ricochets is now pointless to use because it'll always come back to you. That's not what it says and that's not what it did. So what, what was happening before was the shots will ricochet. They will, if you hit it square on, it will come back to you. That has not changed. What has changed is that you were immune to your own bullets before, and now you are not. So now if a shot ricochets and it comes directly back at you, you will take damage the same way anybody else was already. So you just need to be more careful about where you're planning your shots. I'm sorry to say, it's skill issue. <laughs> Some fixes. I'm not going to go through all of the fixes, just a couple that I thought were worth noting. So the superior packing methodology ship module has been fixed as it was not working properly. We talked about this on a previous Helldivers Tuesday. This is the stratagem, or pardon me, the ship module. That means when you call down a resupply, it will fully refill your support weapons. It was kind of shit that this didn't work. Now it does. Very good. A uh, fixed blast absorption ship module so that it correctly increases sentry's resistance to explosions. Uh, very good again, because having sentries just blow up was really frustrating. Fixed an exploit that allowed overly eager divers to use grenades excessively. Yes, this does mean the infinite grenade glitch, bug, exploit, whatever you want to say, is no longer, it says exploit in the thing, is no longer working. Uh, fixed an issue that allowed traders to try to sabotage the extraction shuttle by deploying sentry strats uh, below it. I've had it happen to me. Look at me. Fuck you. <laughs> it's, it's fixed now. You can't do it anymore. Fixed an issue where sickle and quasar cannon could not shoot through foliage. I didn't know the quasar cannon was part of that. I'm very glad that's fixed. Mines are now pingable for better coordination with your team. I like that. I, could you, Garrett, can you ping those for me? <laughs> no. Okay, that's fair. Playing rock, paper, scissors in the front of the ship no longer causes player to fall out into space. I kept forgetting to try this and now it's gone. And I'm sad. I found this one pretty funny. Explosive weapons, i.e. eruptor, crossbow, and grenade pistol no longer pull players inward from the blast. Apparently they were acting as black holes before and that's scary. Uh, and this one was my personal favorite because it's just such a Sims patch note. Dead scavengers will now stop screaming for help if killed while calling in reinforcements. And that's it for the patch notes. While there are a lot of known issues left to address, and I'll put them up on screen for people watching this back in the video version, a lot was done in this update, both good and bad. And I'm willing to accept that this game is not perfect. They will fix issues when they can, and until then, the game is still incredibly fun, and I'll continue covering it each week. This is the longest I've ever gone with my notes section, my news, my recap, whatever you want to say. I'm going to be editing this for the rest of the night. So, without any further ado, we are going to move on to the gameplay section of tonight's stream, and I hope you all enjoyed. For everybody watching this back on YouTube, remember to be gay, do crimes, and we will see you next time. For those of you watching the stream, see you in a moment.